Hello and welcome into today's Irish NFL show with me, Colin Cronin, and I am delighted to have one of my favorite guests back on the show, D- Disney fan, Florida man, JP Acosta. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me back on again, man. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to to come back on. And since we were last chatting, you've been back on with Mina, who now has a beautiful baby boy. You've been on um, with Greg from around the NFL. Um, it's it's fantastic to see. It's great to see you getting the the recognition that your talent so uh, richly deserves. Yeah, it's been it's been wild. It's, I still get people uh, DM me and say, "Hey, your work is great." I'm like, "How do you know who I am? Like, he, what's going on here?" but it's awesome it's awesome well no i you're you are it's good to see you getting the appreciation and um with that well let's start with a a big question what why is the afc south the way it is we we talk (laughs) about we talk about the seahawks right being like crazy and they don't play a normal game the afc south doesn't have a normal season jp yeah they don't i compare the afc south to mad max fury road there's just nothing there but desolation and pain. And sometimes it gets exciting, but most of the time it's because a car is flipped and turned and lit on fire. That is based with the AFC South is. But this year, it feels different because most of the teams feel like they have a good foundation. And by good foundation, we also mean they have a quarterback who can win you some football games. You know, the Jaguars, of course, we talked about, they're going through a lot of like, they need to kind of just chill out, but they have Trevor Lawrence. You can win a lot of games with Trevor Lawrence as your quarterback. Trevor Lawrence can win you a lot of football games. But the young guys are playing extremely well so far. C.J. Stroud, I believe he is still one of the only passers in the NFL to have not thrown an interception yet. So that's impressive for an ex- for a rookie. And Anthony Richardson, the stat, the counting stats might not look it, but he's playing extremely good football. The offense is being built in such a fantastic way around him. The Titans are once again the Titans. They they're never going to go away. It feels like they are like Patriot South, where no matter what they have going on on offense, they might not have everything going fully 100 percent, but they're always going to play a knockdown drag out battle with you. So it's Fury Road once again in the AFC South, and it makes it even more fun. And I think what's really intriguing about it this year is the addition of, you know, the two extremely talented young coaches. So you've you've already got a Super Bowl winner with Dougie. You've got Vrabel, who is Mike Vrabel. I don't think there's anyone quite like him. And obviously with uh, Steichen and with D'Amico, um, in, I suppose, you know, wh- one of the questions, it was funny, I had... Um, Mia uh, O'Brien on last week to talk about the the Jags in the first game, and um, she posed the question to me, so I'll pose it to you. Uh, in terms of where, if well, we'll leave him in the room. Leave the elephant that is Jim Irsa in the room. In terms of a five year trajectory, would you rather be the Colts or would you rather be the Texans right now? Hmm. Uh. You know, I think I would, for a five-year window, I'm kind of leaning Colts, but that is banking a whole lot on Anthony Richardson's potential as a quarterback. I love C.J. Stroud and what he can do. If Anthony Richardson is what we all believe Anthony Richardson can be, that is a Josh Allen level of quarterback. That is Cam Newton south basically like that's the kind of guy you're getting and then you know they still have the defenders on that defense to force buckner they the only reason why it's really really close is because those guys are getting older whereas the texans defense is still very young will anderson franchise piece very young player rookie Derek stingley jr very good second year jalen petre very good safety second year They have a bunch of young guys in that defense that makes it easier to believe in them going forward. But as we all know, quarterback is what stirs the drink. That's the most valuable position in the sport. If you have one of those dudes, if you have a Mahomes, a Josh Allen, a Justin Herbert, you have those guys, you can win a lot of football games. And I think Anthony Richardson's ceiling is a lot closer to that than C.J. Stroud's is. 
Um, now, you've written some great pieces over on SB Nation, and for anyone who is listening or watching, cannot advocate enough checking out JP's stuff over there. Um, one of the pieces, obviously, uh, was uh, in relation to the Bills and Josh Allen, who the Jags will take on um, this year. J- I don't know if you know the Twitter account that is We Rate Dogs, and uh, a few, uh, a few. I think um, probably a year, two years ago at this point, they had a tweet that said the dogs are getting better uh, and they move from like 12 out of 10 to 14 out of 10. Is Josh Allen getting even better? I think Josh Allen is getting even better, which is funny because I think I remember a tweet that said Josh Allen plays like how a golden retriever will play quarterback. And it's just, it makes so much sense because Josh Allen, the biggest thing about Josh Allen is he sometimes has the zoomies as an NFL quarterback. Like sometimes he's going to, try and hurdle over a, a linebacker from nine yards away from the first down marker. Sometimes you're going to throw that ball in a double coverage across the middle of the field. It might work. Sometimes it might not, but sometimes it might work. That's what you buy in on. But what I think that Ken Dorsey and the Bills offense has insulated Josh Allen with is the ability to take the layups, the ability to remain efficient without forcing Josh Allen to do everything. Against the Dolphins, Josh Allen went into supernova mode because he was able to take the layups and force the defense to start pressing. And then he was able to take those deep shots. It's a lot like boxing or MMA. You don't immediately come out throwing the haymaker. You know, you want to, you throw the jab a little bit, you keep throwing it. If they can't defend it, keep throwing the jab. And then as soon as they try and clinch up for the jab, now you hit them over with the haymaker. And that's how you land the knockout blow. You can't just immediately come out like guns blazing, you know? So I think that's what something that Josh Allen has learned. That's something that Ken Dorsey has built into this offense. And that's something I think that they wanted to do going into this offseason. You draft Dalton Kincaid, it makes you a lot better in 12 personnel, makes you even better in those short yardage areas, makes you more efficient there. You draft Osiris, Osiris Torrance in the second round. You want to be better in a phone booth running the ball. Osiris Torrance has played fairly well as a rookie starting right guard. You know, so it's made everything more efficient. That's what you want to do. You want to make Josh Allen and this offense more efficient in the short areas. That'll allow him to think, okay, I don't have to do everything myself. I can just take this dump off here and throw for five yards. That's cool. Instead of Josh Allen going, oh no, nothing's working. I have to go into Minecraft creative mode and throw this ball in a triple coverage. Yes, in, indeed. I love the idea of Josh Allen uh, as a Labrador. That is uh, fantastic. Um, one, of, I suppose, one of the pieces that I thought was interesting before the the season, and in fairness to you, like you took some big shots, was around some of the bold predictions, and some of them have proven true, some of them less so. But um, the Giants, right? I think the Giants are a team that have probably disappointed you a lot, and I know you wrote about this recently. But again, about the like, and there uh, kind of you ended your piece saying there is no easy fix to this. But like, what do what did the Giants do? Did, did they just keep trotting this out there every week? Because I mean, Brian, Brian Dable is going to go through an awful lot of um, tablets if that's going to be the case. There is no easy fix, and the main reason there's no easy fix is because there aren't a lot of good NFL offensive linemen. You know, that was a problem. That's been a problem in the NFL for the past five years. Every every good, it just has to do with the amount of like people on earth. You don't find a lot of people who are 6'3 and above and over 300 pounds and can move like an NFL offensive lineman. And the odds that you do, they are already in the NFL on another team. So now you're stuck with the Giants, with this offensive line that has not improved over the last five years. So now you're stuck with a bad offensive line. Evan Neal has looked horrendous in his second year, even though like the hope was Evan Neal will follow the Andrew Thomas level of like consistent development and growth. And Andrew Thomas is an all pro. John Michael Schmitz is their promising rookie center. Everything else outside of that has been poor this year. It's been abysmal. And a lot of that has to do with Daniel Jones as well. And I think Daniel Jones, the thing about him always has been, He can't feel pressure. So if you have a bad offensive line and a quarterback who can't feel pressure, those sacks turn into strip sacks. Those bad plays turn into chaotic plays. Those chaotic plays turn into turnovers. And that can't happen for a guy you paid $160 million. So there is 
there's really nothing much you can do outside of like punt on this season and bench your $160 million quarterback. But even then, you want to put Tyrod Ty- Taylor behind this offensive line? Like, there's nothing, there's no real easy fix. It's Brian Dayball, as much as I give him credit last year and Mike Kafka credit this year, they have run out of answers. They've run out of ways to mask the deficiencies of their quarterback and their offensive line. They just can't do it anymore. They don't have the guys. And I suppose I, I mentioned at the start there kind of jokingly about Dable and, and the tablet, but we've seen a lot of angry coaches uh, already this this year. I'm thinking Matt LaFleur at, at the podium, uh, Sean Payton getting very snippy. Um, why are coaches so angry so early? Well, I've always said football coaches are the least least well-adjusted people on earth. They're the least normal people on earth because you have to be a psychopath to coach football. That has to be like your thing. I know this NFL, but talking about college football, Urban Meyer, who ruined, who the main reason they hired, the Jaguars hired Urban Meyer is because they thought they were getting University of Florida and Ohio State Urban Meyer. The reason Urban Meyer was not that Urban Meyer anymore is because being that kind of maniac and coaching maniac every 24, 24 7 thinking about football literally almost killed him. So that's how non well adjusted you have to be. As a football coach, you have to be this 24-7. And when it's not working, you start to get snippy because that is everything you got at this point. Like, I get, like, with Sean Payton, Sean Payton, I feel like he's he's kind of developed some kind of tenure where, like, oh, I want a Super Bowl. I'm I'm cool here. I'm definitely, I can say whatever I want, actually. Yeah, I'll tell you Nathaniel Hackett was the worst coach in football. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? I got a Super Bowl. Remember 2009? Yeah, I got that. Um, Matt LaFleur, just very, it's all just been very funny. Even Brandon Staley, after the uh, after one of the losses, is like, yeah, we're not, we're not thinking about Jacksonville. And he kind of snipped at him about it. But I feel like coaches are a lot angrier this year because coaches are just not normal people. They have always been like, they're always running on hot, you know? And it just takes one, one bad game to kind of, forcing the blow up you know yeah no fortunately no one in the nfl making a holy show of themselves like trent dilfer um <laughs> the, i i am you know that um that kind of tweet that came out a few years ago that's become kind of the the kind of and it's so true the the qb tweets are love my guys and um tight ends are just derp um and the wide receivers are always the deep dark mysterious ones i wonder if if we got if we had head coach tweets what would they just be all caps and like tons of exclamation marks all the time it would be all caps tons of exclamation points and eating razor blades you know they're they are all on 100 all the time except maybe like mike mcdaniel mike mcdaniel's probably the most like the most well-adjusted coach but even then, he's like a football maniac. He's out here designing plays that like force defense defenses heads to spin. Like he's he's also not a well adjusted person. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't imagine so. Um, Caleb Williams, gifted, talented, a, a brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, potential talent. We see him do it week in, week out. Can anyone? Can anyone live up to the hype, though, that the media is building up around this guy? Like, is it going to be? I mean, this guy is essentially going to have to enter the league as some sort of cross between like Mahomes, Brady, Montana and Peyton Manning. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I have never seen people are talking about him as a guaranteed Hall of Famer before he's finished his final year at USC. Yeah, I feel like we just all need to take a deep breath. We all need to relax discussing Caleb Williams because I don't think he is the same level of prospect coming out as Andrew Luck or a Trevor Lawrence. Caleb Williams is very good. He's a very good quarterback. I just don't think he is on that type of level yet where you could say he is a generational prospect. I think he does a lot of he can create so well such a great creator know, knowing where space is he's also big enough to take the body blows that kind of the Bryce Young kind of knock on him with the size Caleb Williams is big enough to do that stuff at the NFL level 
I just really do worry about his his not uh, he's not averse to throwing the ball in the pocket. It's just he seems a lot more comfortable when every pass he's holding on to the ball for 45 seconds and the play is just super wide open and he can kind of, you know, freelance jazz it, you know, he can, he can ad lib, you know, he is very much a, he's that one kid in middle school jazz band who takes like jazz classes by himself and he thinks he can just ad lib everything in the middle of a song. Like, Hey, you, you might be able to, but you don't have to do that on every song. We are just playing crazy in love. You don't have to go into a whole solo, bro. But Caleb Williams is very, very good. I do think that's something that he'll have to iron out at the NFL level. But I think we all just kind of need to slow down a little bit with the comparisons to Hall of Famers like Tom Brady and like eventual Hall of Famers like Patrick Mahomes. Um, I, I, the jazz thing, I have a friend, I don't know if you've ever read any James Joyce, but basically he decided he was going to try to approach reading Finnegan's Wake a bit like jazz where he dip in and dip out. It was still completely, uh, unintelligible, uh, for, for him. But, um, why, why do you think there is such, like, is it just that the, the insatiable appetite for there to be a new narrative means that the media is kind of bored with the, it being Mahomes, Burrow, Josh Allen, and it's like, we just need somebody new? Or like, because I, I don't, like, going back, it probably is Andrew Luck where I heard this type uh, of talk. And and even then, I guess you didn't have the the same kind of um, media kind of scrum. You didn't have all of the podcasts, all of the social media, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a reflection of both where we've come from in terms of quarterback development, where now all these guys are getting specialized, like Caleb Williams has been throwing with a quarterback trainer since he was probably 12 years old. He is a specialist at the quarterback position now. I think that also combined with, you know, he we've we've seen him grow. Like we've seen him develop since he was a freshman in high school. He was the number one recruit coming out of college. He was the number one quarterback recruit coming out of coming out of high school. We've seen him do spectacular things at Oklahoma and now USC. So it's just that consistent buildup of, oh, this guy's this young guy from high school. I think he might be pretty good. Oh, this guy's in Oklahoma doing crazy things. Oh, he just won the Heisman. Now we're here to where like, oh, don't worry about not getting a quarterback in this past draft because Caleb Williams is going to be coming next year. You tank for Caleb. But it does. I feel like we do this every year with quarterback classes, quarterback prospects. We we build them up to be super hyped, generational prospects, compare them to crazy, crazy high standards when we just need to let them be them, you know? Like sometimes I get when to compare. You got to let them grow up. You got to let them be their own person. Yeah, I guess uh, potential. People kind of always love the uh, the possibility of uh, of potential. Um, one of the podcasts that you do, uh, NFL Super Friends, um, you you are kind of in, in the middle this year, right? With the with the Jags, Evan is having the time of his life. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Oh man, the Jaguars are a they're an interesting team. They are very interesting. I think they are they banked so much in the offseason on internal development that it hasn't happened yet. So it's kind of like, uh oh, like this is this might not be that great. But they're still in a position where, you know, you're two and two, you're tied for first place in the AFC South, you got a whole bunch of season left. You can still turn this around. You can still be the team that you thought we were going that we thought you were going to be. You know, it's just the offensive line has to iron itself out. That's really the biggest thing. you got to figure out a way to have the offense be a little more downfield. It's not saying like, oh, go full bombs away, look like the greatest show on turf, or like Patrick Mahomes throwing 80-yard touchdowns to Tyree Kill. Just they want to live in the 10 to 19-yard range. They haven't been able to do that 
consistently are good enough. It's all just been screens and RPOs, which is fine, but eventually you're going to have to throw the ball downfield. And they can't do that because they don't trust the offensive line. So until that, until that irons itself out, the offense will continue to look sluggish. And for Jarrett, is there any fixing that Steelers offense? Um, unless they launch Matt Canada into the sun, then there's nothing fixing it immediately. I mean, that's really the biggest thing. They haven't scored, I believe, uh, the ringer Shield Kapadia has a running tracker of how many games the Steelers go without scoring like over a certain amount of points. I'm going to see if I can find it. But it's it's bad. I can't really I can't really say anything else outside of like you know the Steelers have gone 39 straight games with Matt Canada without going over 400 yards of offense. Like that's that's really bad. That's that's anemic offense and th- it's ruining a defense that's been very very good, still very good. You have to get you have to make a change at some point. If you're Mike Tomlin, you gotta get rid of that guy in order to get the most out of that offense, which is still very talented. There are a bunch of talented guys on that team, on that offensive line, on that in that receiver room. You're just not getting the most out of him with a guy who can who can only do like he runs a collection of plays and not an offense. You know, so that's that's not going to work at the NFL level. You uh, were in the midst uh, a while a while back of composing what I would call a puka nakua chant. Maybe you'd label it a song. Uh, you backed away from it. I think you should lean into it. Like I think that's the one area where I'd love to see kind of the NFL embrace football culture over here. Is is in the chants. Yeah. Uh, I. I remember there was uh, years ago, uh, Manchester United fans uh, had a chant about a player um, who came in to the side, a younger player uh, who called Danny Pugh. And it was, I don't know if you've ever heard the Black Lace song, Agadoo, um, but it was this, this kid who was like making essentially his first team debut. He wasn't a big name and the fans already had a song to go to that, which was like Danny Pew, 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 tall and skinny like a bean. Danny Pew, 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 he'll never get in our first team. Anyone who knows the tune of Agadu will, will know that. So I, I am tasking you, JP uh, Acosta, with bringing chanting, real chanting to uh, to the NFL. Lean into those Puka Nakua chants and uh, we should get that going, I think. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to try and do it. I think what I had going, like the I'm workshopping it. If you don't know, I'm workshopping the Puka Nakua. I'm workshopping his name into the song Copacabana, into the chorus of Copacabana, which I feel like it's working a little bit. Like I got throw it to Puka, Puka Nakua, greatest receiver west of Minnesota. Yeah, it's like you get it. It's- I I think it can work. I think it's good. I think it just the second part of the course, I'm trying to figure out what words to put along to it. So maybe I'll like scheme it out with my guys at SB Nation. We'll we'll come up with a little chant, but I do agree. We need some more football chants. We need some more like proper English football chants here in the NFL because like be aggressive, be, be aggressive. That only works so many times. You can only be so aggressive. You know, you can't raise that aggression. But you can put players' names to random obscure songs, and that just make it even better. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I, you have been uh, generous with your time and uh, conscious of that. But before um, you go, I suppose, for, um, something that's intrigued you, good or bad, right? I, I, last time you were on, it was just before the season started. I said, what would intrigue you? Here we are. We're 23.5% of the way through the season. What is it that's kind of captured your attention? So the, stuff, the thing that's caught my attention is how much motion has been used in NFL offenses. We all know like the little, the Miami Dolphins little burst motion. I call it out motion. Kyle Shanahan calls it cheat motion. I think I'm gonna call it cheat motion too, because it's cheating basically. It's basically like arena football come to life in the, in the NFL. You, and you know how in arena football, they get a running start running forward. You're basically doing that with Tyree Kill just running outward. You know, and now you're like, oh, wow, Tyree Kill's running at me at full speed because he just were able to run out right before the snap. But now everybody is doing it. 
And what I think has been so cool is how the how the motion in the passing game and the running game has both been tied to creating angles, you know, like football, especially on offense, is very much about angles, lines, spacing. It's geometry, you know. You always want to – it's like the triangle offense in basketball. You always want to have an option within that triangle. Like I think the most popular one is mesh, where like if you read out mesh, there's a crosser route going this way, there's a crosser route going that way, and then there's a little over-the-ball route right in the middle. You just read that triangle. One, two, three, you throw it to the uh, to the rep, to the mesh going one way, you throw it to the middle route, or you throw it to the mesh going the other way. So with that most with motion, it's basically creating those angles. You're creating the ability to widen people out for somebody just to either come back in or you know, create spacing for your offense to thrive in, and especially when the NFL hash marks are so condensed it doesn't look like college football where everything's so spread out everything's so wide it's a little more condensed in the nfl level so that's something i'm really intrigued and in looking at because you know it started with the dolphins using that little cheat motion but the 49ers started using it and it's so cool seeing how the 49ers and dolphins run the same thing but to get to different outcomes the dolphins are more vertical displacement they have speed guys who want to get at you but then they can also do the They'll run a guy 20 yards downfield, but then also have a guy running 10 yards behind them on like a dig, and then they use that speed that way. 49ers, they're not going to have the ball going downfield as much. It's more, we're going to throw it five yards, but you can't tackle us. We're going to have guys who can break every tackle on earth. And so it's so cool seeing how they get to the how they get to their own answers in the same way. One of the things I've really enjoyed uh, from you this season have been the kind of AI cover songs that you've been putting out there. Um, and I actually, uh, when, you know, I compared um, Daniel Jones to Patrick Starr on Tuesday's show because he's trying his best, God help us. But he just, yeah, he looks like Patrick, that, that, that everything is going wrong. Do you have a favorite AI cover? My favorite AI cover is SpongeBob and Patrick singing Bartender by T-Pain and Akon. It'll always be my favorite one. I'll send it to you after we get off of here, but it's so funny. I have it bookmarked in my TikTok. It's just, it's my favorite one. And then there's my other favorite one is Plankton singing Higher by Creed. I posted that one early in the season. It's, it's just so funny. I think it's the greatest thing how we were all like, oh, now we have artificial intelligence. What has the world come to? What kind of great things will we be able to do? Nah, we're just going to have Plankton singing Divorce Dad Rock, which is perfectly fine by me. But it's just funny to see how that outcome turned out. In, indeed. And very final question, because I can't let you go without that beautiful Nintendo hat sticking out there. Do you have a favorite Nintendo game? Ooh, favorite Nintendo game. Man, um... I was always a big Yoshi guy, so Yoshi's Island, always my favorite. That was one I played a lot, Game Boy and Nintendo. My brother has a Nintendo Switch, so sometimes like when I'm with him, we'll play Super Smash Bros. We'll play uh we'll play Mario Kart a lot. And then my friend had one when we were in Chicago, we played Mario Party. And that was Mario Party might be one of my favorites. You may be too young to remember this. On the NES, right, it, there was a game called A Boy and His Blob. And you fed the blob different sorts of jelly beans, which led to the blob turning into things like a trampoline or um, a ladder to help you navigate the, the game. It was one of the most psychedelic things I have ever seen, um, but it was uh, magnificent. Uh, JP Acosta, you have been as wonderfully entertaining uh, as always. I hope you're career continues in its upward trajectory anyone watching listening check out jp you can find him over on uh, twitter but on sb nation his um, written pieces are absolutely fantastic as well cannot thank you enough for taking the time to chat to me today thank you for having me on again man it's always a pleasure